So, um, what I'd like to do is introduce to you Katie Middick, who is the Director for Platform and Mobile Marketing at, what are you on right now? You're on Facebook. Right. So, Katie Middick leads platform marketing for Facebook with responsibility for shaping and growing innovative products for millions of developers and businesses that engage with Facebook's community. Over 800 million users. Amazing. These key offerings include personalization, distribution, and payment services that power the social experience in games, media, and commerce across the web and mobile devices. Previously, Katie held executive positions at other companies we know, like Palm and Yahoo, and other successful startups. Uh, she serves on the board of eBay, which is a great accomplishment as well, uh, and also on the board of the Special Olympics International. Um, if you're um, tweeting at her, you can't because she works at Facebook. So you can subscribe to her updates, um, which is facebook.com slash Mittick. Super easy, which you should obviously be doing. So without further ado, um, I'm bringing in Katie Mittick. Thank you. Thank you. Testing one, two, three. Can you guys hear me? Um, I'm excited to be here with all of you today. Um, there is uh, nothing I love more than being in a room in Silicon Valley filled with women. Like, it's just so cool. Just look around. This is awesome. So congrats to uh, the team that's organized the event today. Congrats to all of you for being here. And um, I'm just so happy uh, to be a part of it. Um, the best part about the people in this room is we're here, we're women, and we're building great products. Because we all know that great products are foundations for great companies. And we see examples of this all over Silicon Valley. Um, Steve and Waz building the first computer for the homebrew club. Homebrew club. You know, built for, built for love, not for money. Um, Mark in his dorm room at, at Harvard. He was building a product that he really felt just needed to exist. And of course, you don't need to go to Silicon Valley legends to find budding examples of this. You can look at Fab in their recent product pivot, or Pinterest in their recent traction. Or listen to Katerina this morning um, talking about being a, a product leader and really building great companies from great products. And so these products, these companies, are built from people who define themselves by what they build. They put the product first. These are companies that we've come to know as product culture companies. And it's never been a better time in the Valley to build a product culture company. It's so much cheaper to build stuff. I mean, it just costs like 10% today of what it cost 10 years ago to build and deploy these products. You can just, you have the idea, you can just go build it, you can just put it out there. And it's such a larger market. We have over 2 billion people on broadband internet today. That's up 25 fold in the last 15 years. Think about that market for your products. And of course, it's my favorite um, trend of all fueling innovation, social. It's like we woke up one day and realized that the nodes at the end of the network, at, at the ends of, these of the network, were actually people, not content, not machines. Um, Katerina was talking about this today, talking about humanizing technology, where we can all experience more together, discover more together, share more together. It's more like real life. And of course, as the web starts representing more of who we are as people and as humans and our humanity, it's no surprise that women are playing more of a role. If you just look around this room today, you see lots of evidence of that. We're the power users of social media. Uh, we spend 30% uh, more time. We have 20% more friends. We upload 70% of the photos, even though we're just 50% of the audience. Zynga will be the first to tell you that the 30 to 40 year old demographic is their core demographic. They've built a business providing services to women, 30 to 40. And of course, we're not just coming along for the ride, we're driving in this revolution. Again, the people in this room represent that. Um, at Facebook, women have, have built and have led teams building some of the social innovations you know and love. Um, Jane Chen on, on our beloved news feed. Lucy Zhang with our recent innovations in, in messaging with Messenger. It's an exciting time for all of us in this room. 
It's an exciting time for product culture companies that take great ideas, turn them into great products, and then great companies. And this all sounds really great, and you're probably thinking, do I have a product culture company? How do I get a product culture company? How do I become more of a product culture company? And so one of the things I wanted to do today was share with you the things that we've learned along the way on this topic at Facebook. So uh, product culture companies start with the mission. The mission is all about the focus. It's the why are we here, what are we doing? It has to be big and ambitious enough to, to inspire and motivate teams to do things they'd never even thought were possible. Especially in those early years when small teams of engineers and developers and designers need to outmaneuver companies with far more resources. It needs to be ambitious. It needs to be clear. Because the, the, the product is the way that product culture companies make the playing field uneven. So the more tightly focused all those resources can be, the way you can get the smarts and the creativity and everything channeled in one direction can make all the difference. So at Facebook, our mission is really big and it's ambitious. It's to make the world more open and connected. It's much bigger than all the people that work at Facebook. It's much bigger than everything we've done in our first eight years combined. In fact, we like to say that we're just 1% finished. And so how does, that, how does that mission help us? Like, what's the evidence that um, that, that helps you know, build great products and build a great product culture? Well, a couple of examples. If you take um, photos in 2005, um, we asked Scott Marlett um, if he and a team of maybe one or two other engineers could build a photo service that hundreds of millions of people would be interested in using. Now, if you can think back to 2005, Literally, we had hundreds of photo sharing services with thousands of features. You could do all sorts of stuff, red eye reduction, cropping. You could take a, a photo and turn it into a mug, a t-shirt, a skateboard. Like, you could do anything. If you were, if you were, if you were up here in 2005 pitching um, a new photo service, the venture capitalists on our, our esteemed panel here would be like, why? What's going to make it different? But Scott and team were up for the challenge. And they launched a service that year that didn't have a lot of those features. In fact, it had very few features. They had one feature that made all the difference, and it was photo tagging. And that makes sense because photos are a very social thing. They're about the people. When you look at pictures, um, it's about who's in the picture and what were your friends doing. You want to share pictures with your friends, and you want to see your friends' photos. And it's all about the people who are there. It's about making, making photos more open and connected. And so that focus, that crystallization, made all the difference. And then take, take Facebook videos. Saleo Cuervo and uh, Chris Putnam were really frustrated. They took a lot of movies with their, with their mobile phones, but they were having a hard time sharing them with friends. It was just too hard to get them off the phone, to share them with their friends. And so one day in one of our hackathons, one of our 24-hour code, code against the things you don't normally have time for in your day job, they decided to solve that problem, and they built in 24 hours a Facebook videos product. We launched it two weeks later. No one asked them to do that. They did it in their quote unquote spare time. They saw a gap between what we were delivering as a company and making the world more open and connected, and just decided to go build it and just go do it. They knew it would be valuable and core to the mission. So 3,000 people come to work every day at Facebook to make the world more open and connected. I came to Facebook because I believe our lives are going to be so much richer when we experience them together. And so we all come together and move in lockstep. Which brings me to the second um, uh, point, which is the importance of people in building a product culture. It's really important that those first 10 people are setting the culture that you want to set. That's the beginning of where it all starts. And it's really important that those people are product lovers, that they live and breathe the product. When you hear or read early accounts of Facebook, um, they talk about Mark and his team sitting around the table, coding the product, eating the product, dreaming the product, talking about the product, thinking about the product. They weren't doing PowerPoint. They weren't building Excel models. It was just about the product. 
And even today, with everything that Mark has going on, if you stop him in the hall and want to talk to him about an idea that you have about, about a product, you get his undivided attention. Now, this doesn't mean that every single person you hire has to be a product manager or an engineer. Of course not. It takes lots of people to make a product work and make a company work. But what it does mean is that those first people that you hire, they need to be there to make the product successful. They have to make the product they love successful. So this showed up at Facebook when we, when we first um, had business development starting at Facebook. It was about partnerships to extend the product. Or in marketing, it was about PR and communications. How can we make the product the star? So that diversity of skill sets and interests and experiences is so valuable, but so is a shared understanding and a shared love of the product. And it's important, of course, to get this right early because it's much easier to have a product culture at 1,000 people when you've had it at 5 and 15 and 50. Now, if you have a great mission that's clear and ambitious, you're surrounded by product lovers, what's left? Shipping, and shipping, and shipping, and shipping, and shipping. If product is the lifeblood of a product culture company, it has to be moving and shaped, being shaped and changing all the time. Builders love to ship. It's the way that we get progress. It's where users tell us what's working and what's not. If you walk around Facebook, you'll see, po you'll see posters everywhere. Some of them will say things like, done is better than perfect or move fast and break things. It's about one simple idea, which is build it, get it out there, learn, and iterate. Repeat, and just keep doing it, and doing it, and doing it. Shipping isn't the end, it's the beginning. And the listening and learning that can happen after shipping is the part where the product becomes successful, and your users can co-architect an experience with you. So Facebook hasn't grown to over 800 million people just by chance. It's core to our mission. We had a product team against it, and the team listened and learned. When we initially put a team against growth, basically they paid attention to what was going on in every market, and they looked at the product experience of a new user. And they were looking carefully for what are the signs, what are the things that those users get that come in quickly and then keep coming back day after day after day. What is it about their friends, the number of friends, how they found those friends? And they continually, even today, years and years later, do that, looking for the, looking for the golden bits that help growth and, and grow us even further faster. Or the photos experience that I was talking about. The inspiration to do photos at all came from watching uh, you know, Facebook employees and their friends changing their profile photo. It turns out that people wanted to change that photo it was a, a part of who they were. It was their self-expression that they wanted to, they wanted, that was a part of telling their story. And so, you know, the idea was like, hey, why don't we just go ahead and address what users are already trying to do with our product? So this isn't always easy. It's not always rosy. Um, the, my favorite experience of how difficult this can be is the story of our newsfeed. So um, if you can remember back to Facebook in the early, early days, I don't know how many of you were in Facebook, on Facebook in those first couple of years when it was just open to, to college students. But you had to go profile to profile to see what was new and different, interesting, and what was happening with your friends. So the product team, being the great product experience people that they are, came up with this idea, you know, wouldn't it be much better if we could take all the changes that were happening with all of your friends' profiles and put them in one place? I mean, you logged on, like, that's what you saw. That was what your, where your experience started. Sounds like, it, you know, sounds like it makes a ton of sense. It'd be a lot easier for the user. It'd be a far better experience. So they built that and launched it. And for those of you who remember, it was not a celebration. It was actually met with protest. We had over 10% of our users, a million, but it was over 10% of our users, join a protest group on Facebook <laughs> to protest Facebook. Um, this is quite unfortunate, and, and, and the, team was, you know, the team was struggling. Like, that was a really hard thing to get that feedback. You know, you're really excited to launch it, and you get protests back. And it got more complicated, because while users were protesting, they were actually eating newsfeed up 
activity was up, engagement was up. And you're looking at this going, oh my gosh, you know, they love the product that they're protesting. <laughs> and so the team had to work hard, really hard, to find those subtle but important changes. A lot of changes happened during that period of time with the product. To find those subtle but important changes that made all the difference and meant that people could embrace newsfeed. And today, that, that newsfeed, that page, is the most popular page on the internet. We're all pretty psyched that team did not get spooked by the initial reaction. So as I look around this room today at all these great entrepreneurs, I leave you with a couple of thoughts. One, is your mission clear, ambitious, will it inspire your team to do things they never thought were before possible? Is everyone in your product, in your company, I mean everyone, from the greeter to the data analyst, are they there to make the product that they love successful? And do your users love your product? Like, do they really love your product? And are they not just telling you that, but are they showing you that? And are you changing and iterating and listening and learning every day to make that an experience they love even more? It's an awesome time for everybody in this room. It's a great time for great ideas to become great products and become great companies. So good luck to you all and happy shipping. Thanks. All right, wonderful, that was beautiful. All right, so um, we have time for two questions. Who's gonna shoot up their hand first? Right here in the front. Oh, no, I promised someone here. Hold on. <laughs> I have short term memory. Great job, Katie. Thank nice. you for that. And really clear messaging for what helps make companies successful. As, as I run my own company, I'm often challenged with the balance of the voice of the customer and my own pet hypothesis of how the product should change. I, I assume Mark goes through the same thing. And certainly, there's a lot of technologists. And one of the things I love about this uh, new day and age, and I was talking to an executive the other day, that it's so important that even technologists are treated like business executives because they've got terrific ideas. How do you balance that voice of the customer from this gut as well as trying to manage kind of encouraging technologists to be innovative and not just be coding? Yeah. So, um the big difference uh, in my experience between companies that are more of this product culture company and those that aren't is the amount of time spent debating what the user wants. Um, and at, at Facebook, like those, you have those conversations and then it's like somebody just build it and ship it. Like let's just see, let's just learn, let's create three versions of it. It's, it's, it's really, you know, it's not so much that, you know, there's a huge meritocracy in terms of ideas, but where the rubber really meets the road is what happens when you get it in market. So it's a great way to end an argument and say, we're going to just agree as a team to disagree about these things, but we're just going to go ahead and build it and see what happens. And so when all the voices are heard in that process, and then you make, choice, you know, you make choices based on what actually happens when you're in market, that makes all the difference. Hi. I have a quick question. Uh, if we are making a product and shipping that product, so do we need to focus upon the speed of making that product and shipping, or we have to stick to make that product uh, best, like to make it as a, a best product and then ship it? So what we have to yeah. think about, shipping it fast or making yeah. it better and then ship it? So the, the challenge with um, waiting to ship until you have the best product is it, like most of the time, the thing that you think is the best product is actually not the best product. It's a bunch of these little decisions that kind of build up and culminate into this best product that then when you get it in market, there's like things that aren't working, there's things that are working, right? That's when the product development really, really starts, right? In, in earnest, because now you're getting the feedback and you can make the changes and you can learn from like what's working and what's not. So because it's so much cheaper today, 
I really encourage entrepreneurs, like build it and put it out there. And you can probably hear it in some of the questions that um, came up with some of the VC panelists, like, well, who's using your product? And how many people are using your product? Because when the, when the product has momentum, when the product has people using it, that's the sign that there's magic there. There's something there that has the potential to be this great company. It's like the product has to exist because people are using it and people want it and they're having good experiences. So I, I really encourage like ship early, ship often, and, and don't wait, let go of the idea of a perfect product because products are just changing and evolving all the time. And it's better to get it out there and let those little changes happen as you go because then you're gonna end up with the best product. Perfect, thank you, Katie. Thanks. Thanks.